we were told that we we're going to go to the moon, we we're planning and we we're training and we we're doing everything. You know, sometimes you get into a project that you really never quite see the end. You're working hard, you forget about the, the final part, the, the completion. And that to me was sort of uh, the way I felt. We're going to the moon, we're training this, we're doing that, we're learning something else. And then it was on the day of the launch, before light, it was still dark when the three of us went up to the gantry. Now you have to remember that there's no one else around except a couple nervous checkout people. The rocket itself is filled with five and a half million pounds of high explosives. Everyone else is a comfortable three and a half miles away. <laughs> and as my two companions were the first to go into the spacecraft, where the gantry is some 330 feet tall, and there's a bridge across there, they walked across it and they went into the spacecraft. I was left alone, fully suited up uh, and breathing pure oxygen. And I looked at the night and I saw these lights come down and was, this was the press corps that was manning the, the press sites at that particular time. And then I looked down and I saw the ground and I looked at the press corps and I said, these people are really serious. We're going to go to the moon. <laughs> And you know, it suddenly dawned on me that this was not another Earth orbital flight. This was the accumulation of the training we had done and the decisions we had made that in, unless something in the, last, in the next couple hours happened, this spacecraft and this rocket were going to take off and we're headed for the moon. Nobody had ridden on the Saturn V, and even though there'd been, what, two unmanned Saturns, uh, apparently they didn't have the accelerometers in the right place because they soon, no sooner lit this thing off when I realized that we had missed one major part of the simulation. The, the, the sideways vibration with those big, huge, 1.5 million pounds thrust each engines, gimbling around, trying to keep this thing straight. Uh, the center of gravity was way down here. We were up here like a ladybug on the end of your automobile antenna. So as it moved down here an inch, this thing moved a foot. And uh, it, we, I literally felt like I was being uh, thrashed around like a, a rat in the jaws of a, of a terrier. And I was convinced that the, the fins were bouncing up the uh, girders of the spacecraft, of the uh, launch uh, tower. Also, the noise was deafening. There was no way we could communicate. Now, Frank, he told me later, was smart enough to take his hand off this launch abort uh, handle, because as uh, fighter pilots, it's much better to die than it is to screw up. <laughs> and uh, that's why we're all short, you know. And uh, But uh, uh, there was no way, if I detected, I was sort of the, the flight engineer, and so if I detected any kind of problem uh, on the uh, instruments, I couldn't see them, they were just kind of going like that. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to communicate them to Frank, and if I had seen him and communicated, he wouldn't be able to do anything about it anyway. Well, we, uh, it seemed like an hour when we cleared the tower, and uh, the noise started coming down a little bit, and things smoothed out, and I thought, boy, if we miss that in our training, what else have we missed? <laughs> so it was pretty spectacular, and then as we as we uh, burned the fuel out of this first stage, it's extremely heavy, probably, what, half of the weight of the vehicle? That's when it was loaded. As it burned its fuel down, the whole thing became much less massive. But the thrust was the same. You know, for those who went to high school physics, F equals MA. So as F is the same and M goes down, A goes up. So at, uh, at cutoff, what do we have? About four Gs, something four like that, half. four and a half Gs. Suddenly, the rocket cut off. Instantaneously, some retro rockets fired. Uh, then the uh, uh, primer cord sheared off the first stage. To me, where my fluid, we were on our backs, so the fluid in my ears were pinned to the back of my head, and suddenly it all sloshed forward. And I could not resist throwing my hand up in front of my face. Like It felt like I was being catapulted, like one of these Captain of Castile catapults right through the instrument panel. Okay, that went so I threw my hand up. About the time my hand got up here, the second stage cut in. Whack! <laughs> so I looked up and I had my, my face, my helmet on, and here was this gash across my helmet. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, when the big boys see this, you know, it's going to just, you know, justify the rookie position. Well, we made it into orbit, and somewhere along the line, uh, 
I collected the helmets, and I noticed that the other two guys each had a slash. <laughs> so my point is there's no rookies on the first Saturn flight. Everybody's a rookie. The launch was exciting, and then we went on to the coast. Uh, I, we went around once and a half around the Earth, and then over, it was over Hawaii, wasn't it? We got the go for TLI, much uh, go for translinear injection. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't think we would ever get that because I knew darn well that NASA wouldn't commit, it, commit us unless everything was really perfect. But over Hawaii, um, Mike Collins said, Apollo 8, you go for TLI. We lit the S-4B, started out, picked up, what, 25,000 miles an hour? 35,000 feet a second. 35,000 feet a second, 25,000 miles an hour, and uh, started toward the moon. Now, in order to keep the heat load equal on the spacecraft, we if that was the sun, we positioned ourselves perpendicular to the sun and then just rotated all the way to the moon. We, so we, I think we probably have the record for revolutions. Yeah. Uh, and it, it barbecue kept... Barbecue mode. It, yeah, we call it barbecue mode. About, oh, I don't know, about two or three... I, I might as well get this out of the way right now because it'll come up sooner or later. And it but, came up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I began to feel funny. We're not <laughs> I'll tell you, it wasn't a bit funny. <laughs> you know, Jim Lovell and I had flown for two weeks, and I had never gotten sick. I'd never been sick in an airplane, but I, I really wasn't feeling too good. And so I managed to throw up all over him. <laughs> and, and that caused great consternation back on Earth when Anders wanted to squeal on me. I wouldn't let him. So finally, he dumped it on the tape, and they read about it. And then you, eight hours later, I covered, <laughs> I covered his tail for eight hours. But interestingly enough, all the scientists and Dr. Van Allen was convinced that we got fried going through his ionosphere belt. This and that, the doctors were going nuts, and we wonder as if we, we they couldn't decide whether or not they were going to abort the mission. They didn't have much to say about it, really. Frank, <laughs> Frank, I have to tell you this right now, but we were going to the moon regardless of what happened exactly. to you. Exactly. <laughs> One of the important things on the flight plan was when we would lose communication with the Earth. Because as you go around the moon, the communications would be blanked out because it was S-band radar that uh, we were using to communicate. And so that was a very critical point. We, we had never seen the moon, as John mentioned. And uh, I was really, it was perfect darkness, and we were flying backwards. Hoping, aiming 240,000 miles, ending for aiming for a place 60 miles above the lunar surface. So I was watching that time very, very, very closely, uh, and hoping that we were on track. And just at the minute we were second, we were supposed to lose communication. We lost it. And I, thought, boy, that's great! What a wonderful deal! I said we just lost it right on time. And Anders says, uh, "Well, they probably turned the damn radio off." <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Okay, now I got you to the moon. You guys take over. <laughs> well, we, as Frank said, and as John said, we didn't see the moon because we weren't supposed to look at it because the sun was sort of right behind it, afraid it hurt, we'd hurt our eyes. But when we uh, uh, oriented the spacecraft going backwards along our path, just as we were cutting in front of the moon, like, like high schoolers trying to outrace the train uh, in their jalopy and be beating it by a yard, uh, it, we went into the shadow of the moon, where we were both in the shadow of the moon from the sun and the shadow of the moon from Earthshine. And it was dark. I mean, it was, it had been kind of just, the sky was sort of a gray. You couldn't see stars very well, but it wasn't dark coming to the moon. But now it was black. There were stars everywhere. You couldn't tell which ones they were. There were so many. And I remember looking back and uh, seeing all these stars, and suddenly there was this big black and I got to tell you, the hair went up on the back of my neck because that was the moon. And uh, when we popped out of that shadow and relit our engines, we were in lunar orbit. That was one of the major decisions we had to make because, uh, you know, if we were, had any problems at all, we'd circumnavigate the moon and come back again. So one of the decisions and what we had to do behind the moon with no communication with the Earth was to of course, light the engine to slow down, and once we did that and everything looked perfect, and then when we looked at the computer, uh, it, it showed that we were in the exact orbit. Uh, I think at that time it was about 60 by 160 miles in a sort of elliptical orbit to begin with, uh, and uh, so everything on this particular flight up to now was working perfectly. Mm -hmm.